This presentation completes our study of electronic configurations by looking chiefly at doing diagrams to represent electronic configuration. By the end of the presentation, you ought to be able to draw this kind of diagram to represent the electronic configuration of atoms from hydrogen through to krypton. You also ought to be able to give the outer subshell structure for elements beyond krypton in the periodic table. And finally, you need to be able to explain why the elements in the periodic table are described as belonging to different blocks, S, P, D, etc. Here's another way of representing the electronic configuration of an atom that you need to know. And this time it's going to be a diagram instead of a written configuration. The diagram without any electrons put into it looks like this. And let's take a moment just to unpack what's here. We've got an energy scale going vertically upwards on the side there. And then if you start at the bottom and look up the numbers and letters, you'll see the same sequence that we used when we were doing the written configurations. The difference is we've got these lines coming out to the right. And I wonder from what we talked about right back at the beginning of electronic configuration if you can guess what those represent. They represent orbitals. Remember we said that an S subshell only ever contains one orbital, P's have three, D's have five. We haven't really talked about that since, um, but now we're going to be making use of that. So the lines represent the orbitals of each subshell. And just note that the orbitals of any one subshell are all at the same energy level. So you draw them horizontally out uh, to the right of their subshell label. Now we've got to put the electrons in, and to do that we'll take an example. So we'll take sulfur with its 16 electrons. If we were to do the written configuration, it would look like this. And so somehow we've got to show two electrons on the 1s orbital, two electrons in the 2s orbital, two in each of the three 2p orbitals to give six electrons, and so on, up the diagram. How do we actually do that? Well, we use arrows, and if I put the electrons into the 1s subshell first... We get this. One up arrow and one down arrow. doesn't matter which order you write them in, uh, but you do have to have one up and one down when you've got two electrons in an orbital. Now, uh, we could give a whole lecture on just what that means. And to be honest, you don't need to go anywhere with that information. You do need to remember that with two electrons in any one orbital, one must be an up arrow one must be a down arrow. If you, don't, if you only have one in an orbital, it doesn't matter what you draw, either up or down, makes no difference. Very briefly, the arrows represent a quantum feature of electrons called spin. Uh, you have two possible spin states for electrons, and in any one orbital, the electrons have to have different spin states, and you represent the, the spin state by up arrows or down arrows. And enough of that, um, just in case you're thinking, I hate chemistry, um, then don't worry about that bit. Just remember that you need the up arrow and the down arrow when you've got two electrons in any one orbital. Okay, let's carry on, put the rest in. So moving on up, we're going to be getting this until we get to the 3p. And at that point, I've only put three in just to make a point, which is that when you don't have a full subshell, you must spread the electrons out between the orbitals. So with our four electrons, we can now start pairing up. So with four electrons in the 3p subshell, we don't put two pairs in two different orbitals. We put one electron in each of the three orbitals, and then we start pairing up. So it ends up with a pair and two single electrons. Another example. Why don't you have a go at doing this one? Germanium with 32 electrons. Pause the video. See if you can sketch out what you think the electronic configuration would look like for germanium as a diagram. Well, the written configuration is as shown. And if we pop that into the diagram, we get this. So we should have two electrons in every single orbital right up to the 4p subshell. And then the crucial thing here is you haven't put two electrons into one orbital. You have put one electron into each of two different orbitals. So remember, you spread out the electrons between the orbitals of a subshell as far as possible. You might be wondering, 
Does it matter which two orbitals I chose to put electrons in for the 4p? No, it doesn't matter at all. And you might be wondering, does it matter whether I've used up arrows, down arrows, or a mixture? No, it doesn't matter at all. So you could have had one up in one, one down in another orbital, and you could have used any two out of the three orbitals. Makes no difference. One final practice for you to try. Chromium, 24 electrons, what would the diagram look like? Well, the trap here was that you forgot that chromium is one of the exceptions. 4s1, 3d5 at the end of the configuration rather than 4s2, 3d4. If you got that right, your diagram should look like this. So far, we've only discussed the elements up to krypton in the periodic table, and those are the only ones that you need to be able to give detailed configurations before. But now, actually, we need to clutch our courage and venture beyond Krypton into the unexplored lands of the periodic table beyond because we do need to be able to give a bit of information for the other elements in the periodic table. And what we need to give is described as the outer sub-shell sub structure only. Well, let's look at what we mean by that and we'll use our friendly periodic table to help us here. As an example, we'll think about the element antimony, which actually has the symbol SB, and I've circled it in red there. So how do we give its outer subshell structure? What does that even mean? We look at which period it's in. It's in period 5. So we're only going to be talking for, for antimony about the subshells that belong to sh shell 5. That's its outer shell. So we only want the bits that belong to shell 5. If we remember the blocks in the periodic table, we've got the S block and the P block highlighted there. And so for antimony, uh, the 5S has filled and it's then filling the 5P. The bit of the D block in the middle, if you remember, that belongs to the uh, fourth shell and so doesn't, isn't relevant here where we're only talking about the outer subshells. So we can therefore write for antimony, its outer subshell structure is 5S2 because we've filled the 5S and then 5P3 because it's the third element in to the P block of the fifth period. You obviously want to try one for yourself. So have a think about polonium, PO, I've circled it there in red for you. What would be its outer subshell structure? Remember, look at which period it's in. Think about which subshells of that period have filled completely and which are still filling. Pause the video, see what you come up with. And you should have written 6s2. Cesium and barium, Cs and Ba, have completed the 6s subshell. And then polonium is the fourth element into the 6p bit of the periodic table. And so it ends 6p4. Well, congratulations. You have reached the last little detail that we need to know about electronic configuration. And that is uh, to be able to explain uh, this idea of blocks in the periodic table. Here's periodic table with the blocks labelled. Now we've made use of this idea throughout and so hopefully you've got the sense by now that these blocks in the periodic table are in some way related to uh, subshells in the electronic configuration. What you actually need to be able to do is explain for any given element why it's in the block it's in. So for instance you could be asked about sodium. Sodium's in the S block and the question could say something along the lines of explain why sodium is, co is called an S-block element. Now what you can't do is just go, uh, because it's in the S-block. Uh, we need to give something a little bit more intelligent than that and relate it to this idea of electronic subshells. And so what we say is the highest energy electron is found in an S subshell. We can do that for any element. So if we went over to the P-block and chose, for instance, oxygen. Why is oxygen called a p-block element? Because oxygen's highest energy electron is found in a p subshell, and so on. Same for any element, just look what block it's in in the periodic table and say that its highest energy electron is found in the subshell of that letter.